And I will be continuing the AITM discussion from a slightly different perspective. So we will be unraveling the threat landscape, so where we are when it comes to AITM, but also I will teach you about uh, how can we detect and prevent uh, those types of attacks from the blue team perspective. Uh, before I introduce myself, um, I wanted to thank my V team that works um, tirelessly on the AITM TTP detections and threat actor attribution. Uh, this deck wouldn't be possible with, uh, without anonymous heroes from Mystic Defender for Experts team. And my name uh, is Paweł Partyka. I'm just the messenger uh, in some of the aspects of this presentation. Uh, I work as the security researcher at Microsoft in the Defender XDR, or I used to work until June 1st, um, so with my focus area on uh, adversary in the middle and business email compromise. So last around three years, I have been working with my team on identifying the patterns and ways to detect AITM using Defender XDR capabilities. So it's not about preventing email delivery, it's about what happens afterwards. So what happens when the user actually signs in, what are the signals that we can leverage to detect uh, AITM or consequence of AITM, which is very often business email compromise. And we didn't stop there, we continued, okay, we do just don't want to alert customers about the fact that there was someone falling prey to AITM. We also wanted to automatically disrupt those attacks, so more on that later. I recently moved to Ghost, uh, which is Global Hunting Oversight Strategic Triaging, very long uh, name, uh, so I will be more in, uh, working on Threat Intel, but for this conversation, let's focus on Defender XDR capabilities. And I'm based in Switzerland. So the agenda is very straightforward. First of all, I will introduce you to the threat landscape. What is the situation when it comes to different actors on the AITM market? Uh, what are the different indicators that those um, AITM fish, uh, fishing kits leave that you can maybe hunt for you in your environments? And finally, what are the detection and prevention mechanisms that you can implement? All right, so the threat overview adversary in the middle um, credential phishing, what we have seen in the last couple of uh, years is that there was, that some of the threat actors have learned that they can actually work less and re reduce the risk of exposure by providing tools and services and support instead of conducting the full-fledged attacks, right? So we, uh, they basically license the tools for a fee to affiliates, uh, which either pay for the service or um, participate in the profit sharing. Uh, this trend led to release of several uh, phishing as a service offerings that I will be uh, highlighting today. And basically it meant that the segmentation and of the cybercrime economy led to the democratization and reduced the barrier of entry for even low, uh, low skilled uh, cyber criminals to start phishing using adv advanced techniques, right? So this ease of deploying certain phishing as a service solutions meant that um, like every, every um, unsophisticated soft, uh, threat actor could now start uh, using and collecting session co cookies and replaying them against uh, victims that even had uh, multi-factor authentication. We see that most of the attacks are opportunistic um, rather than targeted, though we also see nation state actors using um, some of the phishing as a service solutions and they follow the traditional pattern, right? So there will be a so threat actor would craft an initial email with a lure and that would when clicked, uh, leads to another um, third party, usually intermediary uh, website with another lure, and then only the victim will uh, land on the, uh, on the phishing uh, AITM website. So a little bit of history, where did we start and where are we now? So we, if Jinx was released in 2017, uh, version 1.0, it was an open, it is an open source, free to use tool, but it was mainly used by red teamers, right? We didn't see uh, AITM being the, um, the most important type of phishing uh, tool um, or phishing capability until basically 2021 when Evil Proxy came to the market. And this rec, uh, really uh, reshuffled the market. Uh, a lot of threat actors that were launching traditional types of, of phishing actually shifted towards AITM. And this was the first phishing as a service uh, release with extremely powerful uh, support capabilities and extremely good uh, tutorials, how to configure it, how to use it. So the uh, uh, 
people that were basically joining the community of, of uh, being uh, fishing threat actors uh, could easily ramp up and start uh, fishing using high uh, volume campaigns. Of course, uh, probably the profit margins uh, that uh, authors of EVD Proxy uh, achieved uh, encouraged other uh, cyber criminals to join. And in 2022, another very prolific and popular uh, phishing kit was released, Naked Pages. Um, in 2022, we, for the first time, we blogged uh, as a Microsoft about this phenomenon and uh, with, in conjunction uh, on in relation to business email compromise that often follows uh, AITM campaigns. There were other actors that were joining um, uh, greatness, fishing kit, caffeine, transition from traditional fishing to the, to the uh, AITM. So nowadays, basically, we see that the traditional fishing, even though it still exists, um, it is less prolific than um, leverage of AITM capable uh, kits, right? So now more than 50% of phishing attacks already leverages AITM. That's of course also because more and more organizations deployed uh, MFA. So now I wanted to deep dive a little bit into different AITM types, right? I'm not sure if you are familiar with the fact that actually we can distinguish between two of them. One is standard, standard reverse proxy and the other one is synchronous relay. So let's start with standard reverse proxy, which uh, Evil Jinx is uh, representative of. So basically in this uh, type of, of uh, AITM, the session is proxied and traverses through the um, VPS or virtual private server that hosts the phishing kit. And there are two TLS sessions established between the victim and the phishing server, and then uh, phishing server and the identity provider, such as Okta, Entry, the Yahoo, uh, iCloud, whatever uh, the operator of the phishing kit wants to target. And of course, the MFA um, session is uh, transmitted back to the victim. Victim com completes the MFA, and then uh, when the identity provider sends the cookie back, then they, are, they can be captured on the phishing uh, server. So a couple of examples of uh, the phishing kits that are in this category, of course, Evil, Prox, Evil Jinx. We also track uh, Evil Jinx as a service uh, offering. Uh, we, have, we don't have um, a threat actor group uh, name assigned to it. We, we identify threat actor groups by storm and four digits. Uh, we identify them right now by this uh, YWNLB. Uh, code name, which is because they often use this as a host name of their, um, in the URL of the phishing uh, sites that they, that they uh, launch. And the most pro uh, prolific nowadays phishing kit that is a uh, reverse proxy is Storm 0835 Evil Proxy. I'm not sure how many of you have heard about it. There, there were multiple blogs, not only from Microsoft, but from other security vendors about it. Um, we also attribute naked pages to the reverse proxy kits, but it's actually not one. It just behaves like one. Uh, you can also think of serverless functions such as Cloudflare, Cloudflare workers, Azure functions as, as uh, standard reverse proxies. So now let's try to understand what patterns each of these kits actually leaves. And I, as I said, I will not focus on the email or URL structure, rather on what is actually in the signing logs. Right, so every of these kids need to sign in the victim to the identity provider, right? So we, in Defender XDR, use a magnitude of signals from different products, including Enter ID, and actually Enter ID is a very uh, good source of intelligence about the fact that there might be an AITM signing taking place. So everything by default uh, signs you in into the Office Home resource by pretending to be Office Home application, what is very important and fundamental for all the standard reverse proxy kits, which is that the fact that the device remote connection IP address, so the victim's um, destination IP address, so the IP address to which the victim will connect, we will see the same IP address in the signing logs in Enter ID or Okta or whatever identity provider. Right, so this is um, not super unusual because if you use Zscaler or other web proxy, you might determinate the TLS session, you would observe the same. But if you combine uh, the fact that this IP address matching happens and the signing takes place from unfamiliar location, from using unfamiliar user agent, unfamiliar browser, um, you might have a detection, right, for that. 
And also, um, I didn't, I couldn't um, like figure out why, but in some of the cases, we can identify the phishing uh, site URL in the referrer field in the uh, sign-in log. So if your identity provider allows you to capture referrer field, you can see what was the phishing website that initiated the, the sign-in. And the fun fact, the, the default evasion or redirection to the Rick Astley already uh, generated 1.5 billion views for that YouTube video. Okay, let's switch gears towards uh, every proxy. So as you can see here, the signing pattern is completely different. The every proxy by default signs you in into Office 365 application, or pretends to be Office 365 application, and the resource is empty, which is already like unusual, right? It, normally when you sign into the, to any resource, you would have the resource name in the signing logs. Uh, again, device remote uh, connection IP matches the identity provider connection IP, uh, um, identity provider facing IP address. The um, interesting en uh, enrichment into evil proxies capabilities was auto click of keep me signing. So the victim doesn't need to select yes, no, do you want to stay signed in? They do it on behalf of the of the victim. So it means that the operator of the phishing kit will get a persistent cookie. That's, that's the goal. And they redirect to example.com. Uh, after a victim completes the, the, the process, they, by default, will land on this page. So if you see a connection in your web proxy logs to example.com, uh, you can now re uh, go and do reverse engineering why this uh, user actually connected to it. And it's not like an uh, usual site that uh, users might con be opening. They also uh, added another interesting capability, which is refreshing of the stolen cookies. So when they capture it on behalf of the operator, owner of the, of the phishing kit, they will periodically use the stolen cookie to refresh it and gain a new with an extended validation time or validity time. They use it against, again, Office 365 application and very unusual OAuth endpoint will be called uh, Org ID WS Federation. So again, if you're signing logs, whatever your identity provider is, provide you with the OAuth call. Information, look, uh, be at the lookout for the signings, especially when your domain, your UPN domain of your users is not federated. Then, then that would be already a red flag for sure. And we see that uh, evil proxy, uh, this actually varies. Uh, this is, there are, these are statistics from last 30 days. Um, they are typically ho hosted on GhostNet, uh, Hostinger and DigitalOcean um, providers. And you can see on Telegram, they already have 3,375 subscribers. Naked Pages actually has more, 4,700. Um, they use Exchange Online as the destination. Uh, they redirect the victim to Microsoft Privacy Statement site. Again, the remote um, connection IP address will match the IDP facing IP address. Um, and they host the, the Naked Pages installations are most often uh, hosted on DigitalOcean, Akamai, Data Source, Atlantic. Uh, they often also, actually this is on the uh, operator side, on the, um, on the Fisher side to protect the uh, installation of the Naked Pages with Cloudflare turnstile. And we can see they also customize this message why you need to complete this turnstile and sometimes they, they do grammatical mistakes. We need to review the security of your connection before proceeding, not exactly how it should be uh, written. Fun fact, uh, on uh, May 26th, uh, according to the announcement on the Telegram channel, they ceased operation. So uh, they completely shut down after being uh, operational for two years. And then on the same day, uh, someone also opened a new Telegram channel and started inviting all the Naked Pages uh, customers to join uh, Sakai Pages, new offering, very similar characteristics. We are still learning uh, if there's any difference. Uh, there was initial discounted price for, um, for new uh, joiners, for new, new uh, customers or transitioning customers. I didn't manage to capture what was the discount. I have just the, the current prices. Okay, so now let's move on to synchronous relay. So this is more complicated. 
Uh, also from defender's point of view, I must say. Uh, the infrastructure is slightly more complicated, so the uh, victim will connect to the VPS, or virtual private server, where the phishing kit is um, running, and then through API that the phishing kit master server, let's say, central server, uh, or phishing as a service platform provides, uh, there will be a communication, and then this would be relayed to the uh, phishing as a service platform that then would connect on behalf of the VPS to the identity provider. And this is how the communication will go. So there will be one more intermediary step in the entire communication chain. You might think, okay, if there's a centralized platform that performs the sign-ins on behalf of all those uh, affiliate servers, it might be easy to you know, narrow down the uh, list of IP addresses that they use and you know, just black blacklist them on the identity provider side. But actually, they use uh, residential proxy very often, so there isn't static list of IP addresses that they use. Uh, they cont continuously rotate the IP addresses, even if you, so the, the more sophisticated keys, such as Caffeine, uh, I think Tycoon as well, and they even, if you use the same phishing installation and the same user, every time you will get different IP address in your signing logs, right? So every time mm, they, they rotate it, which is, yeah, which is, which is good uh, from the, uh, attack success uh, perspective. Um, the examples, Tycoon, Greatness, Caffeine, uh, worth mentioning right now, and um, Rockstar 2FA, um, also known as DATSEC, these are the main actors. Um, tycoon, um, very interesting characteristics in designing pattern, I mean, they rotate the user agent, right? So they use actually static user agent, um, so every couple of weeks, uh, they change it. As you can see on, my, on May 8th, they updated the Chrome version to 124. And then since June 6th, we observed completely a different user agent, Axios. Um, we are still like, trying to understand why they sent such an unpopular um, user agent, was, was the idea here. And they sign in victims to Office Home by default. So similar to, to Evil Jinx. And again, uh, many times the sites are protected with uh, cloud for town style. Uh, Caffeine, uh, another very interesting actor. Uh, what is unique about them is that they use different user agent for login part, when you enter your username and password, and then there will be a different user agent when you complete MFA. So also unusual because when the legitimate user performs a signing, there will be the same user agent in all the signing requests. Um, Application, again, Office Home. And uh, some obsolete IOCs. For greatness, they use static correlation ID and static nonce. Uh, they, they already uh, rotated them last, last year. So that's a summary of, okay, what are the characteristics of phishing kits? Um, the most popular ones that we observe, the most popular phishing as a service uh, um, offerings. Yeah, so um, I think this is what we already what or, or we already discussed. Like the naked pages, as you can see, is the only one that leverages Office 365 app ID. Okay, so let's switch gears and now let's talk about the AITM prevention. What can you do to prevent uh, AITM attacks? So the, from the blue team perspective, of course, investment in advanced anti-phishing solution that scans actively the sites is like a must-have. Um, Many vendors don't actually use their own IP addresses that are attributed to their ASN, but use third party to send the traffic when they want to scan a website through some proxy providers as well, uh, just to blend in uh, better into the um, regular traffic. Uh, but from the identity point of view, um, please enable conditional access policies. There are multiple things that you can do in Entra ID conditional access policies that can really prevent AITM. And the unique thing about AITM is that there will be a sign, right? So the traditional phishing, uh, those will, would be ineffective, so you would be left with only anti-phishing uh, uh, protections, but with AITM, you can actually uh, enable entra id conditional access policies. For example, risk-based um, access policies. What are the risk-based access policies? These are the, uh, so entra id has an unfamiliarity model built in that can identify the fact that, okay, this signing is not familiar to any signing that happened in the last 
180 days, right? So the location is different, user agent, browser ID, um, device, uh, just to name few. Requiring compliant devices like com completely stopping um, the AITM signings, like there is no way AITM right now can satisfy uh, device compliance requirement because there, it cannot perform the device authentication. You can also configure trusted IPs, but this, this might be a hassle and it would actually neglect the zero trust uh, architecture. You can require uh, token protection, but it's right, right now in public preview, so it's not supported with all the applications. So actually maybe consider implementing uh, FIDO2 passkeys, which were uh, announced uh, already last year, and now a couple of months ago we also allowed syncable passkeys, so it means that you can store your passkeys in your authenticator app on your mobile, and then you can basically have your mobile and sign into multiply devices using a fish-resistant uh, passkey. And this is what I would uh, spend a couple of next slides on. And, okay, um, Enter ID Secure Service Edge is also a solution. So how many of you know what the passkeys are? Okay, excellent. So just for the for, uh, rest of the audience, passkeys are a FIDO2 credential that can, store, uh, can be stored on a variety of devices, uh, mobile devices such as Authenticator app, other password managers uh, on, on the computer, and also on the security key. So like a traditional FIDO2 security key, you can also store your passkeys uh, there. They can be used for passwordless authentication or just as a second factor authentication. So alone, pass, uh, passkeys are already multi-factor authentications, uh, but you can also just use them to complete the second factor if you are prompted to do so. And this is the fish resistant category of uh, MFA. So if you configure authentication strength, uh, FIDO2 um, passkeys satisfy this requirement of um, fish-resistant MFA. And basically what is stored um, on the authenticator app, on your security key, will be a list of uh, domain, or like a pair of domain, UPN, for which this passkey is for, and private and public key. So anytime you want to sign in, the identity provider will send you the nonce, and you will sign it with the private key, and this process will only trigger when you actually are ac accessing the website for which you have a passkey, right? So if you um, want to access um, fish.com domain, you will not have a passkey for that because you didn't register your, your passkey for that domain before, so it will only work for legitimate identity provider URLs, such as, in my example, loginmicrosoft.com. So I can store, multiply, and pass keys on a single authenticator app on a single security key. And, and this, in this example, I have like shown just two of them. And what happens when you try to um, sign into such a to, to AITM website with a pass key? So basically, the experience vary. Uh, for Evil Jinx, um, you will see it in, in, in a second in a demo. Um, the default fish led from Jan Bakker is not prepared to even uh, operate the FIDO uh, request. I didn't spend time to, to tune it to, to make it work. Uh, what would be the actual error that you would get when you um, even attempt to have a um, correctly configured uh, fishlet for uh, FIDO2 authentications? The caffeine just will tell you that, okay, there is an incorrect, uh, incorrect username and password when you attempt to uh, authenticate with Passkey, and the tycoon basically hangs. So, um, also not compatible with, with AITM. It, it doesn't even allow you to, to select any of the, of the pass keys. The problem that you might arise, okay, what if I have multiply MFA methods and, okay, pass key would prevent me from being fished, but maybe the phishing site will allow me to select a less secure MFA method, right? So what if the... Um, website, um, or I'm not a text-savvy user, and I will actually use text or authenticator push notification to sign in, which is not fish-resistant, right? So how can I make sure as an administrator that users use, um, or the pass key receives the priority during signing? So there is actually a setting in, in Enter ID where you can enforce usage of higher, or most secure MFA method registered on the account, right? So whatever MFA method is registered, the most secure will be offered by default. 
So if you have a passkey, this will be the authentication method offered by, by default uh, to the users. So you can go to protection, authentication settings, authentication methods and settings, and then you can either configure this to Microsoft uh, managed or enabled. And then if you have a passkey, then every time you try to sign in by default, what will happen, um, you will be proposed with passkey. And if you don't have your mobile phone with you, then you can always go to and choose other ways to sign in to, to perform MFA as well. So it's not like you are locked when you don't have your mobile phone with you. But then there's another problem. Some of the uh, phishing kits actually downgrade the MFA, so they ignore the setting, and they just offer a list of MFA methods that are configured on the ac account. And I will show it how it, how it works uh, in a second, but still we have a method to circumvent even that. So with that, let's uh, switch gears and see if uh, demo gods are with me today. Okay, so I have an uh, Evil Jinx uh, instance running, so the demo will start with Evil Jinx, and I will just show you what uh, happens, first of all, when I use a user that requires compliant device, that is configured to require a uh, uh, compliant device to sign into uh, to Office 365 services. Okay, so I'm completing MFA, but the policy actually not only requires uh, MFA, but also a compliant device. Just to prove uh, that a user that is uh, protected with compliance device requirements would get this message. <clears throat> so far, so good. Uh, let's select another user. So you can see the, the session co uh, tokens were not captured on my Evil Jinx uh, server. Now we'll use uh, the same URL, but uh, against a user that is not having the device um, compliant device requirement in the control access policy, but this user has a priority to passkeys, right? So I have a passkey here on my authenticator app for John Doe. What will happen if I try to sign in to the Avery Jinx instance with a user that has a passkey as a default authentication method? I could actually even, yeah, okay, let's, let's use it as a second factor. I could immediately, you know, um, sign in without even a password with, uh, attempt to sign in with pass keys, but then it would error out um, immediately. So I even wasn't attempt, uh, allowed to do a complete MFA. I basically, uh, I get a, when I connect to uh, loginmicrosoft.com common slash FIDO, um, this is, I think the fishlet is not compatible with this uh, destination. And now, again, another experience, this time for a user that is exempted from this policy. What will be the con um, con um, situation for a Megan? Oops. So will, this will be a, a standard uh, procedure This user has a multitude of MFA methods and needs to choose one. Just wanted to show you the comparison. So now the user would need to choose, okay, I want to use face or fingerprint, but if the user chooses one of these, then the user will be, would be uh, fished. So now let's play with real uh, phishing um, Pages. I just wanted to show you the difference in experience when you approach the uh, synchronous relay phishing kit. So this is a live URL for, um, oh, or maybe it was live. <laughs> or I guess just got uh, evaded. Let's see if I use uh, reverse, uh, sorry, in the residential proxy. If it works, 
Yeah, okay. So, um, again, it was Tycoon. Okay, so Tycoon uh, Fishing Kit, again, protection with Cloudflare uh, turnstile. And it doesn't look like a reverse proxy website, right? So this is completely rendered by the backend infrastructure. And also some of the options here are completely uh, unclickable, right? So I cannot even select the uh, passkey. So this is where I would go if I know how to use uh, passkey as a savvy uh, user. I would go to sign in options and immediately select uh, use my face or fingerprints. I'm not allowed to do that. Let's continue. And again, I'm not even offered with the passkey, right? So they ignore it, and I can choose one of these. Let's use uh, Authenticator app uh, just to give them some satisfaction. And of course, when I do it, uh, they will receive my cookies, so it's kind of slow. Okay, uh, this kit doesn't click. This is what Evil Proxy would do. They would click here uh, on yes immediately. I wouldn't even have an option to click. Um, okay, and then they redirect to, to some un, uh, not existent website. And now, of course, the best practice is to go to John Doe's account uh, settings and revoke all the sessions. So even though, even though they have my username and password, they wouldn't be able to do anything with it. Uh, the sessions are invalidated immediately. So all the cookies that were issued to this user until now are now gone. Um, on newly released uh, cookies after this point in time will be valid. So also user uh, would need to sign in to all the applications on his, uh, on her corporate uh, device. And um, I think we still have time. So uh, this is like a prepared demo. So uh, I signed in to the um, Naked Pages kit uh, yesterday and day before, and the N Naked Pages kit was using this 93, um, 188, 163.70 uh, IP address. Uh, this is the, these are the signing logs that you can query using uh, advanced hunting, or you can query using uh, Sentinel if you use your uh, as a sim. And you will see there is a bunch of signings to Office to Exchange Online from that IP. Uh, including the, the ones that um, involve MFA. But also if I go to the device network event, so okay, are there any devices that connected to this IP? Um, I will see some uh, where this signing happened from, right? So this is what I was describing that for synchronous relay um, types of AITM, you will see this IP matching between devices connecting to this IP and also then in the signing logs, you see the same IP. So in this, Chrome, in this case, it was Chrome, you can even see what was the, the URL that the victim accessed. Okay, so uh, I mentioned this problem of uh, that Tycoon represents and also Caffeine that they downgrade the MFA, right? So I wasn't even able to, to, um, to choose um, Pasky. So how can we stop that? As I mentioned, you should configure risk-based conditional access policies. I, in this case, I configured it for any risk level, medium, low, high. And then if, you, if we observe a sign from an unfamiliar location for a user, you should require a certain authentication strength. And in this case, I require passkey. So it means that any time there will be sign from unfamiliar location, only then I would need to use passkey and no other option. I wouldn't be able to use push, uh, text call or push notification. I will only be allowed to sign in if I use passkey, right? So we expect to have uh, unfamiliar signing for every user signing for the first time to a phishing kit for all my users in this demo. Uh, I already signed into this website, so these locations now became familiar for those users, but typically users sign into the phishing. If they sign in, they only sign in once, right? So during this first signing, we want to raise an unfamiliar signing signal, and that should trigger conditional access that would enforce passkey as the only method uh, that users can, can use for the MFA, right? So this can uh, be a solution. Okay, so uh, to, to wrap it up, um, 
a topic close to my heart. Um, as I work in Defender XDR, I think the Defender, oh, basically XDR solutions from any provider, from any vendor are uniquely positioned to detect AITM. Because we have so many signals, much more than in traditional phishing, that is uh, crucial to um, detect those types of attacks. So just the first detection that we released uh, was very simple. So if you have a, an MDE, so Defender for Endpoint onboarded device, we would have the network telemetry, or you will have it also uh, in advanced hunting. And then if we see a user that just clicked like a minute before the connection was established, and then we see a sign from the same IP address to which this device connected, this sequence of events means that, okay, I, I click on the link, I connected through some reverse proxy to the um, entry ID and authenticated there. And if that signing is also unfamiliar, meaning risky, it is no brainer that this, can, that this could be AITM. And this, with the simple methods, um, we were able to release a bunch of detections that have over 99% signal to noise ratio. So they have very, very few false positives. Uh, of course, there are a couple of other caveats, so it's not a full logic that I'm presenting right now. Uh, the rule, for example, also is uh, looking for cases where there is no click because the payload is delivered in the shape of HTML attachment. And then there is an offline attachment that performs all the rendering and it communicates uh, with the entry ID or whatever identity provider that is being fished. So we also look at the um, file save operation. So when you open an attachment, there will be a file, temporary file saved to the hard drive. When we see it, um, uh, we treat it the same as if user click on the link. So, okay, if we have such uh, high confidence detections, right, with over 99% SNR, why don't we not only alert customers about the fact that there was a victim fished by AITM, but we also take the action automatically? So, we introduced uh, two years ago an automatic attack disruption capability for Microsoft uh, 365 E5 customers that are um, Defender uh, XDR customers, and what it means is that when we raise such an alert, immediately the user account would be disabled, right? So it means that even if attacker has the cookie, um, it cannot sign in, it cannot be used for sign-in, and the um, security operation center would be um, reviewing it, and then the attack would, wouldn't progress, so they would gain, get, uh, gain time uh, and the attack would be basically like frozen, right? The, of course, the security operations center now would need to reset the password, re-enable the account, potentially re revoke sessions, but actually uh, resetting the password also re uh, revokes the session, uh, but the replay of cookie wouldn't be um, successful. Uh, we started with disablement of the user account in local ID, which kind of delayed the process uh, because there must be then synchronization from local ID to enter ID. Uh, but now we, in private preview, already run the capability to directly suspend user in, in, in entry ID. So this not only speeds up the process of disruption, of disrupting the attack, but also expands our scope to cloud-only users, right? So previously, if you were using only cloud-only users, then disruption wouldn't be for you. But now, uh, already for private preview customers, uh, it is possible to also disrupt uh, cloud-only identities. And let's now review the real-world example um, from March, where we have observed, um, uh, I think, Swedish customer uh, receiving a phishing email with a link pointing to AITM uh, Tycoon website. Uh, the lure was very benign. I mean, not benign, but it wasn't very sophisticated, as you can see on the screenshot. Um, I think this is an information about uh, yeah, vacation, salary plan for 2024. A user click on it after 20 minutes, and we could see the destination URL was tracker club-os.com, and immediately, one minute later, we see a sign-in from an IP address, and that sign-in was uh, with MFA, uh, which was completed with the text message. It raised a medium, uh, medium sign-in risk, um, minutes, a minute later, user click again, right? So we see another click from the user, and again, sign in. Again, a completion of MFA with text message. This time it was a high, um, 
high, uh, highly risky signing. And as you can see, even though the same phishing instance was used, there is a different IP in the signing, right? So definitely this is uh, the synchronous, uh, synchronous relay type of, of phishing. And, and that's the, the end, right? So this is where the account was already disabled. This sequence of events uh, allowed us to, with very high confidence, identify that this was uh, an ITM. And why? Because we see a combination of um, events, right? It's a different detection than the one that I described uh, before. Basically, the click fact followed by a sign from an unfamiliar location for a, uh, for a user. And also the email that the user received was received from a domain that never emailed this organization before, right? So just a couple of elements that if we stitch them together, they allow us to build high confidence detection. Again, the email delivery was allowed, but with Defender XDR, you can still protect your uh, users uh, post breach, right? So even though temporarily attacker had access, um, actually in this case for 16 minutes until the this element was synchronized to the um, enter ID, um, we, after we disabled the account, this, this uh, attack would be stopped. And um, you might be wondering why user clicked twice. Uh, what we have, when we analyzed this uh, installation of the phishing kit, basically the, after completing the, um, the signing, there was an error. Like there was, the user wasn't redirected to any legitimate website, so probably thought that something went wrong and tried again, and then uh, this actually raised higher risk, uh, uh, more risky signing, which allowed us to disrupt this attack uh, immediately. And we don't know what would have happened next, uh, so this is the goal of attack disruption to prevent attack from progressing uh, at the initial access phase, right? So previously, uh, we also have actually attack disruption for business email compromise cases, where the account is compromised and then can be used to perform financial fraud operations or uh, sp uh, sending some phishing campaigns from your, for, from your account, but this is already post-breach, right? So it, with AITM disruptions, we prevent that from happening. Okay, with that, we are at the end of this session. We have still two more minutes for questions. Um, if anybody has questions, um, yeah, I'm happy to answer.